Hi, I'm Congressman Andy Harris. As a graduate of and former faculty at Johns Hopkins, it's my pleasure to address you and share my support for the extraordinary research underway at our institution, including research with federal support. Given the pandemic over the last year, of particular interest to me is the Biocontainment Unit, which is active in research and innovation for the management of patients with highly infectious diseases. In just a few short years, the Biocontainment Unit has trained hundreds of staff in the care of patients with communicable diseases, and has even been selected by the HHS Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response to serve as one of the regional emerging special pathogen treatment centers, focusing on the Mid-Atlantic region. This state-of-the-art facility played an important role in the COVID-19 response. The unit took in some of the first positive patients, developed additional facilities for coronavirus patient care, developed training programs for healthcare staff, and held hand-on sessions, and even led part of the remdesivir study conducted by the NIH. The work of Johns Hopkins has helped shape our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will undoubtedly be involved in our response to the next pandemic or public health emergency. As a physician who conducted federally funded research and as a member of the House Appropriations Committee responsible for a majority of federal research funding, I'm proud to support the work you've done and will do. Thank you very much and have a great day. Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill. Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill at home. No one ever wants to come to a biocontainment unit, but if you ever become infected with a highly infectious disease, our unit is here and ready to care for you. The BCU has a tripartite mission of providing outstanding patient care, educating healthcare providers about highly infectious diseases, and conducting research to advance the science of containment care and emerging pathogens. The healthcare providers here at the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit come from units throughout the hospital and health system. They've all received advanced training in infection control practices and have all learned how to provide care for highly infectious diseases inside a biocontainment unit environment. The healthcare providers in the Hopkins Biocontainment Unit are among the best in the world. When we're not taking care of patients in the biocontainment unit, we are treating patients throughout the hospital and the health system. We've been asked to consult on cases throughout the country and the world, including when the president was infected with SARS-CoV-2 back in October of 2020. The biocontainment unit extends beyond the walls of our state-of-the-art facility. We've developed a special safety officer training program to help keep our providers and staff safe on our special biodome units where we care for patients with COVID-19. And we've worked with our state health department as well as the National Emerging Special Pathogens Treatment Education Center, or NETEC, to help train other healthcare systems in the, in the care of patients infected with high consequence pathogens. In addition to frontline patient care, at the start of the pandemic, our team has led the Hopkins arm of the Adaptive COVID Treatment Trial, which was the trial that showed that remdesivir is effective in reducing time to clinical improvement. We've created a biorepository to understand the pathobiology of COVID. And we've also created the JH Crown Patient Registry, which has allowed us to do retrospective research to understand the comparative effectiveness of drug therapies and to develop prediction models that help us understand the trajectory of the patient infected with COVID-19. Right now, we actually have a prediction model that's running live in our electronic health record that frontline uh, providers and operations managers are using to understand who is at risk for developing severe disease or death from COVID, and that informs clinical decisions, operations decisions, and perhaps as important, discussions with patients and their families about what they might expect during their COVID illness. Being on the front lines during the COVID uh, pandemic has been the single most important part of my career. It's been an absolute privilege to serve with the talented men and women here at Johns Hopkins who have dedicated their time to taking care of patients, but also trying to understand as best we can the pathobiology of COVID and to to generate research that's going to contribute to, to scientific discovery that helps people in their day-to-day -day lives, but also with drug development, vaccine discovery, 
Uh, it truly is just a, an honor to be a part of that effort and to be a part of such an incredible team on the BCU, but, but throughout the Hopkins healthcare system. To learn more about the Hopkins Biocontainment Unit, please visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash biocontainment dash unit. There you'll find information about the biocontainment unit, our role in COVID-19, and you'll also find links to our COVID-19 Precision Medicine Center of Excellence. Welcome to Hopkins on the Hill. A special thanks to Maryland's first congressional district representative, Dr. Andy Harris, for his message. So today, we speak with Dr. Brian Garibaldi, Medical Director of the Biocontainment Unit, or BCU. The Brian and his team at the BCU have played really a critical role in our understanding of how to care for people hospitalized with COVID, as well as training teams across the state of Maryland and really across the country with best practices for protecting healthcare workers when caring for patients infected with novel viruses. We will take questions as always. So please do pop your questions into the platform below the screen here, and we will get to those at the end of our discussion. So welcome to Brian. Thanks for having me, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here. So Brian, tell me a little bit about what motivated Hopkins to actually build a biocontainment unit. Well, back in 2014, when uh, the, there was an Ebola outbreak in West Africa, every healthcare system in the country had to think about how would we potentially care for patients who presented to our emergency department. And we were actually approached by our state health department and the CDC to see if we would be willing to be a treatment center uh, for any patients that came back to the U.S. with Ebola. And recognizing that we needed to have a dedicated space and a dedicated team to do this, we set about to build a unit that would be able to provide care for patients infected with viral hemorrhagic fevers, but we also wanted to make sure that we had the safe safeguards and infrastructure to take care of patients infected with a respiratory pathogen or a novel virus that we didn't even know about. And that's how the, the biocontainment unit came to be. And shortly after we had committed to building this unit, there was a large federal emergency appropriations that actually led to the creation of 10 regional emerging special pathogen treatment centers. And we were uh, selected as the region three treatment center that serves Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. So you noted its roots in responding potentially to Ebola patients, but also the flexibility while building it to respond to, to viral respiratory pathogens like COVID. So was the BCU used at the start of the U.S. COVID epidemic? So back in late December, early January, when it became uh, concerning or clear that you know uh, COVID was going to be coming to the United States, we worked very closely with our infection prevention teams and our hospital incident command teams to help plan what the institutional response would be to COVID. And as part of that response, our unit was the first unit to activate at the Johns Hopkins Hospital to care for COVID-19 patients. And then for the first three weeks of our response, we partnered with a sister unit that also has airborne capability uh, to take care of the first uh, people under investigation and the first confirmed cases. And that really provided the hospital and the health system about three to four weeks of time to stand up other bio mode units and to really uh, allow our team to help train other staff to get ready to take care of patients in those additional COVID units. So I understand we're going into the BCU today where, where you are located, but that you also have another team in there with the camera and that the Lifeline team is also in the BCU with you today to simulate transport of a person infected with a novel virus. So. Brian, who are the folks in the Lifeline team? And can you describe what, what we're seeing here? Sure, so Lifeline is our uh, hospital transport team um, and they do intra-hospital transports, uh, intra-hospital transports. And back in 2014, we recognized that we would need to be able to get patients with highly infectious diseases into our unit. And so they had designed a special operations response team or the SORT team. Those are members of the SORT team that you're seeing now. And what, what they're doing is bringing a, a patient who has a potential novel virus uh, into the biocontainment unit by using something called an isopod. Uh, and this is a, a pod that was developed to basically have a negative pressure environment to contain any pathogens within that pod so that you can safely transport someone from our uh, loading dock where the ambulance can pull in through our dedicated elevators right up to the biocontainment unit without potentially exposing any other areas of the hospital. Um, and the Lifeline team is made up of EMTs, paramedics, and nurses uh, who have been trained in critical care transport and the SORT team themselves have additional training in highly infectious diseases. And during COVID, they really have handled the majority of our transports for COVID patients. They've done close to 2,500 transports of COVID patients, including almost a thousand 
uh, bringing patients from outside hospitals to get the care that, that, that they need here at Johns Hopkins. So I'm, I apologize, my eyes keep darting over because I'm watching this video on my yeah. second screen over here. It's, it's amazing. Now, I, I noticed, of course, the isopod is keeping the patient um, contained and, and protected. But I also noticed, of course, the team is wearing a lot of protection, protective equipment. And from the COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned a lot about personal protective equipment or PPE which healthcare workers wear to protect themselves from those infectious pathogens. So how do healthcare workers actually know how to put on and take off PPE correctly? Sure, and I'll, I'll briefly mention the, the gear that you're seeing our folks wear today from the Lifeline team. They're wearing our viral hemorrhagic fever enhanced personal protective equipment. Um, and so this is a little bit more than what, what I would be wearing when I'm in the COVID unit taking care of COVID patients, but the basic principles are the same. Uh, they're wearing a special um, personal air purifying respirator that are called a, a, a PAPR uh, that basically provides filtered clean air into their airspace so they don't uh, potentially breathe in any special pathogens. Um, and they're also wearing uh, special gowns and gloves to protect them. Um, basically, back in 2014, we had to design our own protocols here at our hospital based on the gear that we thought we could get through our supply chain to keep us safe. Um, and when COVID happened, we re-examine what we had available and, and looked at the risks as we understood them at the time for COVID and really designed what we thought would be a safe personal protective equipment ensemble. Uh, and working in, in conjunction with our infection control team, we basically designed the protocols that we would need to be able to get into that gear, do our care activities safely, and then to safely get out of the gear. Because we know that that's the, possibly the most risky time is when you're trying to take off this gear, the risk of self-contamination is is, is certainly something that we have to train for and then we have to prepare for. Uh, so our teams created these protocols with infection control. And then once our team was no longer the primary COVID team because we had too many patients in the hospital, we sent our uh, advanced practice providers and our nurses and our physicians um, and all of our team infection control preventions to those other units to train other staff in how to take care of, of patients, but also how to get out of gear. And then we also helped create a, a safety officer program so that every COVID unit that we activated had a person who was skilled in PPE, skilled in the protocols of that unit, and was always a resource to be able to help providers get into the unit safely and then get out of the unit safely. And what we're seeing here is uh, one of our Lifeline team members, Chad, is actually getting ready to exit our unit. So our biocontainment unit has several levels of protection. So he's about to take off his first level of gear in the patient room. And then he's going to exit out into what we call a doffing room, which is another area where he can then take off the remainder, the remainder of his gear. And so everything in our unit is designed to be unidirectional in flow. So you never actually cross from a contaminated space into a clean space. Uh, and that's really designed to keep staff safe, but also to keep the, the entire environment safe. And so you can see that it can, it, it can be a time intensive process to do it right. Right. I mean, this is a slow process, right? Layer by layer. And you had noted that at, at the time that you were thinking through specifically PPE for COVID, you were thinking about the risks and the known mechanisms of transmission for COVID, which not all of them were crystal clear at that point. You were thinking about the supply chain, right? What do you have um, and what can you get, right? As, as the supply, as we all can recall, the supply um, or I should say the demand was exceeding the supply at the time for a lot of this PPE. I'm sure at some point it kind of felt like you were building the plane while flying it here, but then you note you're, you're taking this out onto the floor. Your team members are going to other parts of the hospital to train individuals. Did you also share those lessons um, with, with others outside of the walls of Hopkins? How did you help disseminate some of this information that you were learning? Well, so that, that's always been part of the mission for the biocontainment unit is to provide outstanding patient care, to train locally our staff to be able to be safe and to provide this, this type of care, but also to then disseminate what we've learned to other places. And so in the years leading up to COVID, we had actually partnered with our state health department, um, as well as the National Emerging Training, uh, uh, Emerging Passives and Treatment Education Center, or NETEC, to help design programs for frontline healthcare workers to be able to identify, isolate, and inform about patients who might present with a new pathogen or something that was highly infectious. Um, and actually in the two years leading up to COVID, we were, we were doing site visits all across the state of Maryland and region three doing needs assessments and then working with local health systems to say, hey, what are, what are your spaces like? What is your gear like? Let us work with you to design the protocols that'll keep you safe. 
And as part of that training program, even before we knew about COVID, we recognized that we needed to be ready for a, a respiratory viral illness. You know, we were thinking that it might be MERS or the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which um, has a, at times spread out from, from the Middle East to other countries. And, and so that was an intentional part of that program. And then once COVID started happening, we actually accelerated our ability to reach people through um, webinars and teleconferences, both run through NETEC, but also locally through a, an ECHO program funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, but I think those partnerships and that uh, attention towards disseminating that information that we had built up for years leading up to COVID really helped us to get out what we were learning as quickly as we could. So when when we're talking about you know protecting the healthcare workers, of course, it's so important to, to kind of keep this staff going as they're caring for others. But what does it feel like to be a patient who's being safely transferred to the BCU and then for that patient to receive care? I think our, our video is going to head into the patient room where we're not going to see a patient. But um, Brian, describe who we're about to meet here. Sure. As, as we're walking down the hallway, you may notice that doors are of different colors. And mm -hmm. our unit's been designed so that visual cues keep you safe. So our, our cameraman, Chris, is walking through a green door. He's now entering the donning room space where he's going to put on his next level of protective gear. And then he's going to enter through a yellow door, which the yellow signifies you have to do something before you enter that room. So now he's in the patient room. And, and here he's with uh, one of our advanced simulators, which actually was, um, was purchased through a, a grant through the HPP program in our state health department as part of our Maryland training program. And you can see one of our nurse providers here assessing a patient in the biocontainment unit. And, you know, it, it can be scary. You know, you're, you're in an environment where particularly early on in COVID, we weren't allowing any visitors at all. Um, you know, we, we try to provide contact with the outside world through an enhanced telemedicine system that was custom built for the biocontainment unit. Um, you'll notice that all of our providers have their names written on their gowns in front of them so that, you know, at all times that there's some visual cues to, to help the patient orient to where they are. Um, but we also worked on trying to make these rooms as comfortable as possible. It's hard to see in this view here, but there are lots of different lighting options. There are shades and blinds to try to keep them, uh, to, to give them as much privacy as possible. Um, but we certainly learned through dealing with people under investigation for Ebola back in 2014 and 2015, but also during our first activation uh, for COVID patients, you know, we really have to do our best to try to keep people connected because it, it, it is really uh, a stressful time, not just for the providers, but particularly for the patients when they're, they're in these isolation environments and people are wearing these special suits and masks. Sometimes you can't see their faces. You can't hear them very well because of the, the respirators they're wearing. Uh, so I think we've gotten better uh, at that moving along. And, and there have been some pretty cool innovations here at Hopkins that have been done to try to connect providers to patients, particularly in our ICU, uh, when we're not necessarily able to talk to someone who might be on a ventilator getting their families to record snippets of things that are important uh, about that patient, important to their lives, uh, has been something that, that we've really relied upon to try to build that connection to patients. I mean, obviously a scary time for a patient, and you said a PUI, a person under investigation. I think it's important to note that even before you have confirmation that this person may be infected with a novel virus or pathogen, you're taking these precautions, right? So I think it's probably, you know, it's a, it's a scary time for, for a patient and, and you know, taking good care of them is, is a huge part of that. Anything else you can tell us about PUIs and that process of moving from status PUI to a potential confirmed case? Well, it really starts with, you know, surveillance and being able to test, right? So, so first, you know, we've set up systems throughout our healthcare system that at any point of entry, either through our transfer line, through the emergency department clinics, our regular hospital, uh, we have a mechanism in place to assess for the risk of these types of infectious diseases. What's your travel history? What's happening in the world around them? We've worked with our uh, electronic health record to be able to have automated notifications to our providers to make sure that we remember to ask these questions about travel and potential exposure. Uh, and then it also, you know, you have to be able to test for these pathogens. So um, you know, early on, um, our hospital developed uh, the capability in our lab to test for COVID, which allowed us to, to go from having several days to wait for a test to come back from the, the Centers for Disease Control uh, to being able to have a, a rapid turnaround time in about three to four hours. So we've, we've actually been really successful at recognizing these patients, getting them isolated quickly, testing them, and then moving them to the right place within the hospital based on our pretest suspicion for disease coupled with those test results early on. 
And if it is a confirmed case and they're they're like this, this simulated person here in, in this hospital bed in the VCU, I notice there's a laptop next to this person. There is uh, the, the healthcare provider taking lots of different measurements. There are lots of tools, monitoring devices. So they're not only monitoring the patient for, for clinical decision-making, but you know, there's a lot of data coming from these different systems. Um, I see that you and your team have published many papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals about how to care for people with COVID-19 who are in the hospital. So tell us where that data comes from. Sure. So we, we recognized early on that, you know, we needed to learn as quickly as we could from the patients we were seeing because we knew we were going to see a lot more patients. And we also knew that we had infrastructure here at Johns Hopkins that could allow us to learn quickly and then take what we learned and bring it immediately back to the bedside. And so all of the data that gets stored in our electronic health record uh, feeds into the precision medicine analytics platform of PMAP. Uh, which is something that was built several years ago for this exact situation to take clinical data in real time and feed it back to the point of care. And so what we were able to do is create something called the JH Crown Registry, which brings in all of that data from the electronic health record, but also what you're seeing there uh, on the monitors, the physiologic data, uh, it brings it into one place where we can then you know, use powerful cloud computing uh, software to be able to try to learn about you know, what's happening to patients in the hospital? What's the risk of them developing severe disease or death? We actually developed a prediction model that's running live in our electronic health system right now where our providers, if someone comes in with COVID, they actually get a, a running prediction that one day and seven day, what's the likelihood this person might need ICU level care? And that really informs not just the decisions we make um, in terms of treatment, but it also informs the discussions we have with patients and their families so that we can try to give them a little bit of a sense of what may happen. And so that if, if they unfortunately do become severely ill and need ICU level care, we make sure that we're providing care that's consistent with their wishes and, and that we've tried to build those expectations as best as we can. Uh, we've also used this, this type of data to explore the effectiveness in the real world of medications. So medicines like remdesivir and dexamethasone and tocilizumab that, that you probably heard about, uh, we've been using this data set to explore how those medicines may impact disease and are there certain types of patients that may benefit. Uh, and it's also allowed us to actually expand into the realm of understanding how these medicines might work in populations that are not represented in clinical trials. You know, if you look at a lot of the initial clinical trials, it was mostly white patients. And, and we've had a, a much higher percentage of non-white patients, both from the African-American community and, and, and the Hispanic community. And so we've been able to look to see, do those medicines that worked in the clinical trials, you know, do they actually work in the real world outside of the clinical trial with populations that weren't enrolled? There was another study that Congressman Harris mentioned in his in his message, the ACT study. What question did that study seek to answer and what role did your team play in that study? So the ACT study is the adaptive COVID treatment trial and there's been uh, four arms of that so far. It's a large multi-center study run through the NIH. Uh, and ACT-1 was the study that showed that remdesivir decreases the time to clinical improvement. And so our BCU team led by Noreen Hines is one of our associate medical directors. Uh, and Jade Flynn, who's our, our nurse educator and lead nurse, um, they were the, the site PIs for Hopkins for that trial, uh, which, which showed that you know, remdesivir is uh, an effective medicine for COVID patients and really directly led to that being an FDA approved medicine for COVID. Um, you know, that's something that we've really tried to expand out as the BCU is no longer the, the, the primary site for COVID care. We recognize that, that we still have a responsibility to the health system uh, and, our, and it's within our mission to continue to try to learn as quickly as we can about COVID and, and to really participate in ongoing research, both from the informatics side, but also from the clinical trial side. I mean, it, it's an important point, right? When we don't have information and we need to generate information quickly, like when in the situation of a, of a novel virus, you know, it is about learning from the clinical experience, but then applying rigorous scientific methodology so we figure out what is actually working and what may not be working. But back to patient care for a minute, which is, of course, where all that information eventually goes back to is patient care. Anyone who has spent time in a hospital room knows that there are blood draws. There are other body fluids that are, are tested to monitor the patient in the BCU. If someone is there infected with a novel virus, where do those potentially infectious body fluids go for testing? I mean, do they go to the regular hospital lab or how does that work? So uh, you'll notice Chris is 
exiting for expediency through a red door. We would never do that in, in real life if we had a real patient because he's going from a dirty space to a clean space. Uh, but we have an on-site lab in, in the Bach containment unit. We recognize that we needed to be able to have critical care lab capabilities um, within the unit and try to minimize the possibility that someone outside our unit could be exposed. So we built a, a biosafety level two lab, which is almost a biosafety level three lab, which is the type of lab that you would use for uh, pathogens like tuberculosis. Um, and you can see here that this lab has all of the devices that we would need to run every critical care test that you would want for a, a, an ill patient. Uh, we have these two biosafety cabinets, which themselves uh, have their own um, internal air filtration systems to keep people in the lab safe. We wear full gear in the lab, but this would keep them safe if, you know, if, if there was a breach in their personal protective equipment. And if you look up at the top of the hoods, you can see that they actually connect in through these chimneys into the air handling system of the unit. So the entire unit itself is negative pressure to the regular hospital. All of the air intake is specially filtered on the way into the unit. And then on the way out of the unit, it's filtered through two fan banks on the roof that have HEPA filtration, which is the highest uh, efficiency filtration we have. Um, each one of those fans can operate the entire unit. So we can maintain, you know, do maintenance on one fan and, and maintain the unit itself. And the entire power structure to the unit is run on the backup grid of the hospital, which has two relay stations from the city and two different fuel sources to run backup generators in different locations. So, um, you know, at any given time, we're prepared to run this unit, even if there is a catastrophic power failure uh, in the city of Baltimore until we can come up with a plan to evacuate our patients if, if that need ever arose. But the, the whole focus of the unit is to provide outstanding patient care, but to do it in a way that keeps our staff, our patients, our hospital, our community safe. But as you just described, that's a lot of infrastructure, right? That is, that is, you know, what you call negative pressure, which is essentially so that the air flows in such a way that there are no leaks coming from the BCU to other parts of the hospital, HIPAA filtration systems so that when airflow needs to go in and out, it's done so in a safe way, backup systems all the way to the city level for power. That is a lot of infrastructure. That's a lot of construction. Who who funds this level of, of building for something of, of this caliber of a BCU? So this, this would not have been possible without you know, support from the federal government and, and close partnership with our leadership here at Hopkins, as well as with our state health department. So back in 2014, there was a five-year emergency appropriations for Ebola. And part of that funded the creation of 10 of these units throughout the country. Um, and and without that funding, we would not have been able to maintain our readiness moving into COVID. Th that funding actually ended in 2019. And during COVID, there was an emergency supplemental appropriation that continued to fund our units and actually allowed us to expand into some of the additional training programs that we've been doing uh, and allowed us to, to really function at the highest level of these units to participate in, in COVID clinical care, but then also in education training and the research that we've talked about. So, Brian, the the idea here of having this this enormous BCU in terms of just the the capacity of of what it's handling and these infectious agents, you know, there's there's probably this other important part that you've mentioned before, you know, with the green and the yellow and the red on the doors to to kind of talk about the clean spaces, right? So places where the pathogen could not be. Um, how do you keep this unit clean? How does the BCU stay clean of pathogens? Um, from that infected person who's there seeking care. Tell us more about that. Sure. So it, it starts with attention to detail and protocols to make sure that whenever you're in, your, in your, you're in the unit, if you're not providing direct patient care, you're doing something, you're cleaning something, you're restocking supplies. Uh, and this is really sort of an all hands on deck. Everyone who works on the unit, no matter what your role is elsewhere in the hospital, you're going to be cleaning this unit. Uh, in addition to the air handling system, we have a special vaporized hydrogen peroxide robot system that actually is used to disinfect rooms elsewhere in the hospital that have uh, infections like uh, C. difficile or, or MRSA. Um, but we actually have a dedicated system that will come into this unit and, and clean the entire unit uh, after we deactivate, after we're taking care of a patient. And then we also have to have a way to safely dispose of the waste. And so what you see here, our cameraman has walked into our autoclave room. And so in order to handle category A pathogens, of which Ebola is one of them, these are pathogens that are highly contagious, highly dangerous if you become infected and do not have effective countermeasures, um, you actually have to sterilize that waste. And so we have on-site steam sterilizers that, that our, our nurse uh, educator Jade is now loading 
And what she would do is load the waste on this dirty side of the unit. We have special protocols that we validated through extensive research to make sure that we can actually kill pathogens within the center of a, a, a bag of patient waste. You run that cycle you confirm that there was kill of, of these special spores that you load into the autoclave to make sure that it's doing what we think it's doing. Um, and then you unload from the clean side of the autoclave system. And then we have a relationship with our, our trash vendors say, hey, we've sterilized this waste. We validated these protocols. You can now take it into the normal waste cycle to be incinerated. Uh, but, th but these, these units, the, these autoclaves are, are one of the most expensive parts of having a biocontainment unit because if you didn't sterilize the waste beforehand, you have to actually contract with special companies that handle these special pathogen wastes. And the estimated cost of taking the waste from a single patient for a week of care, if they had a viral hemorrhagic fever, talking about probably half a million dollars per patient per week, if you don't have these on-site systems to be able to sterilize the waste and, and to make it safe to transport. So incredibly cost-effective even if the autoclaves themselves as equipment are, are expensive when you compare it to a half a million dollars a week to care for a single patient and, and remove their, their waste. That, that is pretty substantial. And now these autoclave protocols that you just described to us, this is now a standard for other BCUs, right? It sounds like another example of how this experience in the BCU at, at Hopkins has translated into knowledge that is then shared widely. Um, particularly with other teams working in BCUs and, and working with these autoclaves. So this sharing of best practices and protocols that are validated with the spores, for, exa for example, is this specifically a part of the mission? It sounds like this is really a part of the mission of the BCU because obviously it's not always activated. So in those times when it's not activated, is this what you're doing? You're sharing best practices? Well, yeah, I think you're right, Carrie. We we recognized back in 2014 that, you know, if we didn't activate for a viral hemorrhagic fever patient for many years, we needed to add value um, to the understanding of how to care for patients in this environment because we knew that eventually we would get activated. And so we really modeled our mission here at the biocontainment unit around the mission of Hopkins. It's it's patient care, it's education, and it's research. And so, you know, we've, we've established clear lanes, education and training programs, but we've also established clear research protocols to try to advance the science of containment care. So, for example, over the last five years, we, you know, we, we validated this procedure for sterilizing clinical waste in a biocontainment unit. Uh, we've designed and tested new personal protective equipment ensembles to be able to get out of gear more safely and more efficiently. We've worked with human factors engineers to understand where the potential failure points or danger points are for our staff and come up with protocols that have been shown to actually mitigate some of those dangers. We've worked with our applied physics lab to create um, a cough simulator that actually disperses simulated pathogens through the hospital environment, through the bio containment unit, and then see how the, those pathogens move through our unit, design systems that effectively decrease you know, movement of those pathogens, but also design protocols. You know, when we interact with the environment, it changes the way things move. Um, and so we've really worked to, to establish those types of research protocols to make things safer. We've also worked with our emergency management uh, experts in our Office of Emergency Management at Hopkins CPAR to understand how we can use incident command structure that's usually used for, you know, mass casualty events or other disasters, actually applying that to an infectious disease environment that became the model for how we responded to COVID. We activated the incident command with our infection control team and Office of Emergency Management in January, you know, two months before we had our first COVID patient. And that really helped us to be ready to have the supply chain issues um, sort of sorted out before they, they started to become an issue. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's that's been the model all along. You know, our sort team that, that you met earlier, they have really led the way in designing safe transport protocols for patients who have highly infectious diseases. They work with the military on uh, transporting patients from Andrews Air Force Base to Walter Reed, for example. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I think that that's really been the exciting part is to see all that work come together and, and during COVID to be able to take each one of those aspects, apply it to direct patient care, but then use that to help the health system and then to learn as quickly as we could to help others at other health systems to provide care for the patients they were seeing. So let's be honest. We all hope that novel viruses are a rare occurrence, right? I think after, after this pandemic, I think a lot of us feel that way. Um, so these lessons and all of the, the protocols you just described, 
transferring that knowledge to other BCUs is important. Are there any modifications of those lessons learned that could be applied to everyday environments outside of the time of a novel virus or, or pathogen? And can we use this information in any other way? Well, I think it's important to remember, um, you know, our staff for the biocontainment unit, when we're not in the biocontainment unit, we're working in units throughout the hospital. So our nursing staff comes from pediatrics, medicine, OB, surgery, neurology. Our physician staff is from almost every department in, in the hospital. Uh, and when we go through our training and, and we work on these best practices, our super users and our you know, collaborators go back to their home units with an enhanced knowledge of infection prevention and with an eye towards making things better in the rest of the hospital. I'll give you a great example of you know, how we've really helped improve infection safety throughout the health system. You know, back in 2000, I guess it was 2016, you know, the hospital is always running at a really high capacity. And so we don't have the ability to train uh, the folks who actually clean patient rooms in actual patient care spaces all the time. And so we were able to actually train 600 um, folks from environmental services in the proper way to disinfect a room. And we did this in a, in a way that we actually hid certain glow in the dark um, dyes in certain high touch surfaces in the room. And they would have to come in and clean the room and we would show them where are the places that you are likely to miss. And you had to pass that test in order to be able to then go out and actually clean patient rooms. And we were able to show that with those training programs and then with refresher courses, we can keep you know, our compliance when we go out and actually do that same spot testing in the real hospital well above 90%. And that's associated with a decrease in, in the risk of transmission of other infections that we know can spread in the healthcare environment. And so I think that that mindset of how can we make things better, how can we innovate, always with an attention towards infection prevention and safety has really uh, led to some positive changes in, in the health system at, at, as a whole. And I will say that part of that comes from our embedded partnership with our infection control preventionists, our, our hospital epidemiology infection control folks. They are part of our unit. We are part of their philosophy and their system. And I think together we've been able to design safe and effective practices that can go out to the rest of the health system. So Brian, You've noted infection control, you've noted all of these different members of, of the hospital staff that come into the unit at specific times and then go back to their home units. Um, my husband was a clinician at, at Hopkins who was kind of called in during this, this COVID um, epidemic. Can you talk a little bit about the, just the extent of the team response that was needed Oftentimes, you know, you are, you're the face of a lot of the COVID response, but I, I think anyone would, would definitely say that this was a huge team effort. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that was like? Well, I think this has been the single most important part of certainly my healthcare career. And I, I would hazard a guess that most people who have been working over the last 14, 15 months would say the same thing. This was a, a complete all hands on deck situation. And even those folks who didn't necessarily go into a COVID unit or provide frontline care, the, the resources and the infrastructure we needed to build to support those who were doing face-to-face -face care in the COVID response required every person at this health, healthcare institution. And, and to be very honest, it required, you know, everyone who's out there listening, everyone who's, you know, at home, uh, you know, even if you're not in healthcare, we all had a role to play in this. I've, I've never been part of something that you know, you could really see how every part of our society needs to work together in order to try to move us in the right direction. It took us a while to get that right. But, you know, I think finally, for the first time in a long time, you know, everyone hopefully can, you know, take a little bit of a, a, a breather, but, you know, recognize that we're not out of this yet. You know, there's still a lot of folks that we need to try to get access and, and um, get them vaccinated. There's a lot of work we need to do internationally. You know, this pandemic's not over until, um, it's over everywhere in the world. And, and uh, you know, I think we're, we're, con we're going to continue to do our part. And it's been such an, an amazing privilege and an honor to serve along the, you know, here at Johns Hopkins with, with the men and women and all the providers and, and staff who have really focused on this like nothing else over the last 15 months. Well, Brian, thank you for being with us today. Thank you to Christopher, Sol excuse me, Christopher Solmonte who is the cameraman. Thank you. This was amazing to be in the BCU. Um, I've enjoyed watching uh, on my second monitor here and, and listening to Brian explain all of this. And really thank you to everyone who has played a role in this, this COVID response from 
individuals who are the security guards, the, the um, housekeeping staff, the sanitation engineers, the, the nursing staff, the, the admin and, and IT teams who have been behind a lot of this and, and feeding that data back when we needed it, the healthcare providers and all the families and to everybody out there who did their part to help control the epidemic and, and our sympathies to all those who continue to mourn and grieve the loss of those um, who died from COVID. But Brian, you know, we, we really appreciate you having with us, you with us today, and we really appreciate the fact that you have agreed to take a few questions. So are you still game for that? Absolutely. And I just, you know, thank you to, you know, thank you to, to Hopkins for, you know, supporting our team through this. And, and, you know, I think we really, you know, this really comes straight down from, you know, everyone in the health system really believing in, in this mission, you know, five years ago, knowing that it might be five years until we actually activated to support this team and the work that we've done. It's really been a privilege to be a part of that. Um, and again, you know, I just want to remind everyone how, how this would not have been possible without the federal funding that we've received over the last seven years to, to make this happen. Absolutely. So here's your first question. This is from Rick. Can you describe how the BCU manages medical waste, for example, through the pipes? Sure. Um, so this is actually um, right below us is, is office space. We're actually in, in an older building that um, had been decommissioned prior to the Ebola outbreak. Uh, and so we actually had to pay very specific attention to how we actually get waste out of the BCU that goes down you know, the toilet, for example. So we have specific protocols in the unit to be able to deactivate potentially infectious waste before we would use the sink or if we're using a dialysis machine or, or if we have to flush the toilet, if we have a patient who's able to, to make it to the toilet. Um, the piping system itself is specially designed. It's actually a wider diameter and it's made of a, a stronger material to resist some of the um, really abrasive chemicals that we use to, to disinfect pathogens. And it also actually goes into the main, you know, acid wash, or the, uh, the main wash out of the hospital. There's no connection between our piping uh, before it gets to the main waste handling system of the hospital. Um, so that's the main way that, that we protect, um, you know, those outside of the BCU from any waste that might go down the pipes. We also, yeah. I, I should say a lot of our liquid waste, um, we actually autoclave, you know, so things from large suction catheters or, you know, wet linens or anything like that, that in other units maybe would, you know, either go into regular trash or maybe would even get flushed um, down the toilet. We don't, we don't do that. We actually autoclave all of the, the waste that we can get to the autoclave. Amazing. So how, you know, all of these protocols are, are very, very important. Thank you for discussing them with us. But what happens, this is a great question. Somebody wrote it. What happens when there is a break in infection prevention and control during patient care, right? What happens when, when something happens and the, and the protocol is, is not followed? Sure. And so I guess that starts with recognizing those breaks, right? And so we've set up systems where you can see right now there's, uh, as Jade is getting out of her personal protective equipment, there's someone who's helping her get out of the equipment. And there's also an infection preventionist who's supervising that process to make sure that it's done appropriately, to make sure that it's done in a staged and controlled fashion. Um, and during times of care in the unit, we have cameras, we have eyes on either in the hallway through our large bay windows or through our camera system. Uh, to make sure that we're always monitoring what's happening during uh, during care activities. Uh, we do have protocols, you know, if, if there's a rip or a tear in someone's personal protective equipment, or if they become visibly soiled um, to get someone out of the room, we even have to, to train. And this is a, a protocol that we always train our staff on is if, if a provider goes down in that space, you know, if someone faints, if someone, you know, passes out, we have to have a way to actually safely get them out of the containment area into a clean space so that we can provide them medical care. And that's something that we've exercised. Uh, thankfully, we did not need to use it here um, in the biocontainment unit during COVID, but you know, I actually was involved in, in one of those issues and in one of our other COVID units where we had to get a staff member who wasn't feeling well as, you know, out safely. And, and those protocols really helped us to do that and keep everybody safe while we're doing that. So this, this kind of moment where maybe a, a protocol is, is recognized as having been bro bro breached and then we have to um, figure out the path forward through there. Is this an indicator or is this a measurement or a benchmark uh, that measures the performance in the BCU? Are there other measurements that you look at to measure performance in the BCU? Sure. Um, so we directly measure these types of, of potential mistakes or breaches in protocol 
through our drill and training system. So we work really closely with our Office of Emergency Management and our state health department to design a series of activities ranging from tabletop exercises all the way to full-scale drills where a few years ago we actually accepted, you know, actor patients from a real transport from Africa uh, through Dulles to the biocontainment unit. And during those protocols, we we video them, we watch them, we, we have eyes on to make sure that we're following our protocols, but we also actually embed, you know, those um, fluorescent dyes to actually see if anyone has self-contamination. And we've actually done some research to develop even better protocols to recognize when there's been a breach in personal protective equipment or a breach in protocol uh, by using a combination of a slurry that uses these fluorescent dyes combined with these fluorescent microbead simulated infections that we use with our cough machine. And we've, we've really done that both to recognize if we're following our protocols, but also to make those protocols safer. Amazing. It's all this work that's going on in preparation, right? Everything is, it's a, it's a, it's an exercise. It's an example. It's thinking, it's training, it's protocols to, to be ready for the time when, when you really need it. What about the other physicians? Um, do all physicians go through training with the BCU? For example, if the nephrologist needs to come in for a consult, how is that handled? Sure. So we have, we have a combination of rostered staff. So we're all, a, a, you know, a self-selecting uh, team here in the BCU. So we have certain uh, folks from OBGYN, uh, from neonatology, from surgery. Um, your husband is our nephrologist, as it turns out. Um, so we have people who, um, you know, do come and train with us so that they're, they're a little bit more comfortable in this environment, but we've also developed just-in-time training protocols. So we, we feel at this point, if we have our nurse educator and our infection preventionist there, we can safely get someone who's never been in this gear into the gear. They can do their normal job in the unit, and then we can safely get them out of the gear. Uh, and that's, that's something that we've had to build in because, you know, we prepare for as much as we can, but there can always be a clinical situation that we have not anticipated. We've tried to uh, use telemedicine to enhance our ability to get other providers into the space. So for example, we have really high definition cameras that you can control from your iPhone essentially. So you could in theory do a consult from your phone and drive the camera and see different parts of the body. And, you know, I can be in the room using one of our ultrasound machines to give you additional diagnostic information, depending on what your specialty is. Um, but, but we realize that we can't prepare for everything. So we do have that, uh, those procedures in place and we've tested those. We did a large scale drill where we simulated the birth of a baby from a woman who had a highly infectious disease. And we brought in a bunch of providers from OB and GYN who had not previously been in the biocontainment unit. And we tested to see if any of them had self-contamination afterward. And we didn't see any uh, using our just-in-time protocols. So even those protocols, we have to test them. We, we're always looking to make things better. That's amazing. Well, thank you to Rick and Cyrus for that series of questions. I also have one more from Tracy. Incredible work. How do you prioritize ID patients during a large scale event who goes to the BCU versus converted space? So it, it really came down to the very beginning, you know, since our staff is self-selector staff from other units, at some point, you know, we have four beds on our biocontainment unit and we have another airborne unit that we help to, to co-staff. At some point, running a four bed ICU when we could convert our 24 bed medical intensive care unit or a surgical intensive care unit or a cardiac unit or a neuro unit or even our PEDS unit. Uh, at some point, it made more sense for our team to provide frontline care in those other units, but also to help those other units prepare, get their space ready, get their, uh, their staff trained. And so, you know, after the first three, four weeks of, of our response, it, it, it became clear that our the, the best use of our BCU staff was to help those other units get ready because, you know, at, at this point, we've seen close to 8,000 inpatients across the Johns Hopkins Health System who have had COVID-19. And, and clearly, we would not have been able to do that without having an all-hands-on hand on deck response. And, you know, being able to leverage our existing airborne capabilities, but also the incredible work that infection prevention and facilities and maintenance, the incident command folks, all of our operational managers did to identify spaces that could be converted into airborne isolation units to build an unbelievable capacity, to build the workforce capacity to staff those units. I mean, every every aspect of, you know, what, what it takes to run a hospital unit was, you know, had to be on steroids to be able to build that capacity very, very quickly. You know, if you look at sort of those curves of how the patients kind of came in and out of, of the health system here, I mean, 
things ramped up incredibly fast. Um, and so it really was just an incredible effort all around to, to build that capacity. Well, Brian, Chris, all of the BCU staff, team members, thank you so much for being with us today. This was great to go inside and, and see what that BCU looks like and having such a thorough tour. Thank you very much for being with us. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thanks to everyone and, and please stay safe. And next Wednesday, we will be talking with Dr. Ben Zychek about how predicting weather and climate patterns like flash droughts and heat islands can help us protect our food, our health, and our safety. He'll discuss his NASA and National Science Foundation funded research and tell us how it's linked to the creation of the Johns Hopkins coronavirus dashboard. And fun fact, also a musician like Dr. Gervaldi, they actually played in a blues band together in college. So the connections continue. But thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Be well and bye for now.